All right, so we are recording. Okay, so tonight I would like to talk about, in fact, I'm going to talk about, I wouldn't just like to, um, talk about the radios, the FCC, and what's legal or not so legal in regards to that. So without further ado, I ran a survey recently of our club members requesting information on your radios. And I asked for three things. I asked for the manufacturer, the model, and the FCC ID. Um, I had, I, I say here I had 51 responses. I actually had 53. Two more responses came in after I made this slide. So 53 radios, not necessarily 53 people, but 53 radios that people had. Um, and just for interest, I, did a little chart of the manufacturer breakdown and you can see uh, most, the most popular radio among the group who responded is Yesu. The most popular manufacturer is Yesu with 26.4% of the respondents. Uh, the second most popular is the Baofeng and the third is the Anytone. So uh, kind of an interesting breakdown. I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that Yesu is the top and that ICOM and Kenwood are represented, but much lower down on the scale. So uh, I'm not surprised to see Baofeng up there, and I'm not surprised to see any tone up there with some of the latest EMR radios that they've had. Um, those are pretty popular these days. So, uh, but there were a few interesting things. And one thing you'll observe here, there's a Baofeng radio oddity and BTEC, those are actually all three Baofeng. And when you put them all together, they're, uh, let's see, 17, 21, uh, 20, 22, 27. It actually outruns the Yesu. So if you put these three together in one category, they are actually more popular than the Yesus. So as far as the models, most popular models were the Baofeng BF-F8P, the Anytone AT5888UV3. Uh, I actually have two of those radios, uh, and I know at least one other person who has one. Uh, the Yesu VX6R, the Kenwood TM281A, which is a two meter only Kenwood uh, mobile radio. The Woshan KGUV8T, ICOM ICT70A, uh, T90A was also represented, but the T70, there were more than, than there were T90s. Uh, the Anytone ATD578UV3 Pro, which is the mobile DMR radio from Anytone, and the ATD878UV, which is the handheld DMR radio from Anytone. So it was pretty interesting running that survey and seeing what people had and what they were able to find out about the radios. So you'll see we have the big three manufacturers, ICOM, Kenwood, and Yesu, the Chinese manufacturers, Anytone, Baofeng, and its derivatives, uh, BTEC, Radio Oddity, and uh, Woshan. Well, what's the difference between the big three and the Chinese ones? Well, there are a few differences. Price, ease of use, quality, and legality. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, when we talk about price, the big three radios, those things will set you back um, at minimum two to three hundred dollars, more likely five to six hundred dollars for uh, a good mobile rig or an HF radio. And it's probably going to be in the thousand dollar range. The Chinese radios, I know you can get a Baofeng for under $30. Uh, you can get the DMR Anytone radios for under $300. Um, I haven't really priced out any Wotions lately. Uh, plus, there are a few other uh, Chinese brands that are out there. Uh, as far as ease of use goes, I found that the menu system on my Kenwood radios is about uh, 6 million times easier to use than the menu system on my Baofeng radio. Um, the Anytone's not too bad, probably only 3 million times better on the Anytone. Um, but, uh, but I know that the Yesu, Kenwood and ICOM have made lots of effort into making their menu systems easy to navigate, make it easy to operate their radios. 
as far as quality goes, uh, the big three manufacturers are going to make a very good quality radio. You're paying for what you get. Uh, you're going to get a radio that's pretty, pretty capable, pretty beefy, um, pretty tough. Your Chinese radios, they're not going to be assembled as well, most likely. They're going to be pretty good. They're going to be pretty good, pretty usable most of the time. You might run into some issues where they don't, um, where they have some issues. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those issues in a minute. And as far as legality, we're going to cover that in a bit more depth as we move on. So when we talk about legality, there's a couple of things that we're talking about. Uh, is the radio type accepted? And you'll hear this phrase type accepted. Uh, what that means is, is the radio accepted by the FCC for the type of radio service that it's being used for? And can the radio transmit on non-ham frequencies? So if you buy a Yesu, Kenwood, or an ICOM, I can guarantee you without making modifications to that radio, it's not going to transmit on illegal frequencies for you as a ham radio operator. It's going to work exactly on the bands that it says it will. It may receive on bands outside of the ham frequencies, but it will not transmit on them. The Baofengs, uh, pretty much you can do whatever you want with those things. A lot of times they will operate on multiple bands that even bands that hams don't have privileges on at all, they will happily transmit on. Uh, that can get you in trouble if you're not careful. So am I gonna get in trouble for using it? Well, possibly. If you're not following the rules and you're transmitting on a frequency that's not legal for you, then yeah, you can get into trouble. So who decides? Uh, in the US, we have the FCC or the Federal Communications Commission. They have the responsibility to ensure that we are doing things in a legal fashion. When I say we, I don't just mean amateur radio operators. I mean everybody in the country. Uh, that means we're not breaking the rules. And so who makes the rules? The FCC makes the rules. So not only do they make the rules, they also enforce the rules. And how do we find out what these rules are? Well, fortunately for us, all these rules are online on the FCC website, and you can quickly go and look at them and read through them. And they're actually, while they're in a little bit of legalese, they're not hard to read or hard to understand at all. They're actually really easy to follow. So we're gonna talk about that a little more down the road a little bit. So the FCC rules are divided into several parts. The parts we mostly care about are part 97, which is related specifically to the amateur radio service. We may also be concerned with part 95, which is uh, personal radio services. And that covers things like FRS, Citizens Band, GMRS, uh, MERS, uh, you know, a couple of other different ones. Um, uh, there's like uh, remote control radio devices for like um, your radio controlled aircraft and vehicles and things like that. Uh, that's all covered under part 95. Uh, part 90 covers private land mobile systems. That's like your public safety radios, your business radios, the paging network, all of that kind of stuff uh, fits into that public land mobile systems. Uh, part 80, we sometimes care about. We don't usually care about it, but we sometimes care about it. That's stations and maritime services. So anything on boats or ships, uh, those are stations in the maritime service and they would be covered under part 80. And then part 87 covers aviation. So if you're a pilot, that's the one that you care about. You don't really care about anything else while you're flying except part 87. So let's talk about it a little bit. Type accepted. So if you look at your typical FRS or GMRS radio or your CB radio or something, those radios are type accepted by the FCC for their specific service. So a GMRS radio is not type accepted for citizens band and it won't work on citizens band. Your CB radios are not type accepted for GMRS or FRS. Uh, just for clarification, FRS is family radio service. GMRS is general mobile radio service. And CB, of course, is citizens band, 10-4, good buddy. Uh, so if a radio is not type accepted for a particular service, it's against the regulations to use it in that service. So for example, if you have a radio, a Baofeng radio, for example, that can transmit on the FRS frequencies, but that Baofeng radio is not type accepted for FRS radio service, it is illegal to use it to transmit on those frequencies. 
Uh, so some of the things about those different uh, services, the FRS restricts the power to two watts uh, and restricts it even further to half a watt on channels eight through 14. And the antenna must be fixed. So the antenna has to be integrated with the radio and cannot be removed. Uh, GMRS allows up to 15 watts for fixed stations and five watts for portable and allows external antennas, but requires a license. FRS does not require a license. CB is limited to four watts on AM and 12 watts on single sideband. Uh, also does not require a license but is restricted to very specific channels that CB has set up for. There are 40, I think, channels set up for citizen span. So amateur radio, how does amateur radio fit in with being type accepted? Amateur radio is kind of special. And uh, I put special in quotes because it's got its own little connotations there. So we, as amateurs, are assumed to have some knowledge about how our radios actually work. That's why we have to take a test. So when you wanna become an amateur radio operator, you don't just say, hey, I'm an amateur radio operator now. You have to go take a test and get licensed, right? Uh, and there are three licensed classes. There's the technician class, general class, and the extra class, each of which requires you showing that you have some level of knowledge where each one requires a little bit more knowledge than the previous one. Some level of knowledge on how radios work how radio frequency works, how all of that stuff actually does what it does. So you're expected to know that as an amateur radio operator. And because we are expected to know that, we are allowed to use non-type accepted radios on the amateur bands. So let me say that one more time. We are allowed to use radios that are not type accepted for amateur radio on the amateur bands. We're even allowed to build our own radios without having to have the FCC inspect them and certify them. And we're trusted by the FCC to follow the rules, not exceed our power restrictions, not to operate outside of our bands. We're trusted because we've proven that we know what we're doing and we pass that test. So they don't, uh, they don't force us by preventing us physically from having a radio that puts out 2000 watts, they just expect us to never do that because we know we're not supposed to, right? All right, so what's up with the FCC ID? So if you did the survey and sent me your radio's information, one of the things that I asked you for was the FCC ID and any piece of electronic equipment in the United States that has been tested and certified by the FCC is gonna have an FCC ID number on a label attached to the device. It's also gonna have this little FCC icon. Can you guys see my mouse moving around here? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so you can see this little FCC with this little C inside the bigger C. That's kind of a, a trademark or logo of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, the label is gonna have that mark on it and it's gonna have some kind of FCC ID. So these are just some example FCC IDs that I pulled off of various uh, pieces of equipment. So. Um, for example, uh, this one is a Bluetooth module. So you can see it has an FCC ID right here. Uh, this one is off of a laptop and it has an FCC ID right here. Um, so you can see that these devices generally have an FCC ID on them. Uh, you'll notice that this one doesn't actually have that FCC icon on it. That's because this image was pre-certification. So this particular device had not been certified yet. And it was saying, this is where it's gonna be or what it's gonna look like when we have that. But they don't have the FCC marker on it because it's not yet certified. All right. So let's look at some of these FCC IDs and see what they say. So we'll start with the Yesu VX6R. The FCC, so this is a picture of the VX6R. It's just a little handheld uh, Yesu radio. Uh, multi-band, it does two meter and uh, 70 centimeter. Uh, and it has wide band receive, which means it can receive uh, frequencies outside of the frequencies that it can transmit on. So the FCC ID from the tag on that is K6620215X20. So if we throw that into a Google search, we get among other things, a couple of hits here. We get this one that says Yesu Musen scanning receiver 2021 5x20. 
C20, 215X20 uh, is the FCC ID. Um, if you look at this FCC ID, there's two parts to it. The first part which is K66, that's specific to the vendor or the manufacturer of the radio. So all Yesus are gonna have this K66. And then the part after that is defined by the manufacturer. So Yesu says this 20215X20 is the code for the VX6R. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at what that says. So if we look that up, and here's a link to this FCCID.io site, which is not an official FCC site, but they bring in a bunch of the information and they put it in a format that's easy to look at and easy to search. So I like to use it. Um, it says here, the FCC ID K662125X20. And then you can see it breaks it down. It has the K66 and separated out. And that's for searching purposes. Because sometimes people, when they search, they don't key it in exactly right. And that's why you'll see it here with O's instead of zeros. It's just in case somebody typed it in the search engine with an O instead of a zero, they still want you to find this page. Um, and it calls it a Yesu Musin Company Limited scanning receiver. So let's look at that. Scanning receiver? I thought this was a transmitter. This is an amateur radio, right? So why does it say scanning receiver? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's look at another one. We'll look at the Kenwood TM281A. So this is what the TM281A looks like. It's two meter only. Um, uh, it's up to, I think, 50 watts on that. The FCC ID is K4444-1700, okay? So in that, the K4 is the identifier for Kenwood, and then the 441700 is the identifier for this. And if we look at that, it says it's an FCC, JBC Kenwood Corporation, 441700, scanning receiver. What up with that? What are we talking about scanning receiver? What's going on here? Well, the FCC certification is not required for amateur radio equipment. So when you read through part 97, you find a section 97.315 certification of external RF power amplifiers. This is the only mention of certification in part 97. So the only thing that needs to be certified for an amateur radio setup is an external power amplifier. And if you read through that section, specifically it says, no amplifier capable of operation below 144 megahertz may be constructed or modified by a non-amateur service licensee without a grant of certification from the FCC. The requirement does not apply if one or more of the following conditions are met. The amplifier is constructed or modified by an amateur radio operator for use in an amateur station. So this is even specifically laying it out that, hey, it doesn't have to be certified if it's built by an amateur, modified by an amateur, and used by an amateur in an amateur radio station. Okay. So what about the Chinese radios? Let's take a look at the Baofeng. This is the BF. F8HP looks an awful lot like the UV5R. Uh, in fact, it may be the very same radio. If we search that one out, we find this information. Look at this. It actually says the application is dual band FM amateur radio. But then it says the equipment class is scanning receiver. How interesting. So we finally, we got amateur radio, yes but it's a scanning receiver is what it's certified as. How about the DMR radios? Let's look at the Anytone uh, D878UV. Uh, I have this radio, it's a great little radio. Uh, it's manufactured by the Quijang Electron Science and Technology Company Limited. The application is digital DMR and analog UHF VHF two-way radio. And the equipment class is licensed non-broadcast transmitter held to face. What the heck's going on with that one? What the heck does that mean? These are commercial radios, okay? They are licensed and certified for commercial use on that uh, part 95, the uh, land mobile radio service stuff. 
they are licensed for that. When we use them as amateur radio operators, we are repurposing them for amateur use in accordance with the Part 97 rules, all right? So can we use the Chinese radios? Yes, yes we can. Because we are licensed amateur radio operators, we have a lot of leeway about what we can use and what we can't use. We can repurpose commercial equipment for our use on our bands, as in that Anitel radio. We can modify existing equipment. That means we can actually open it up and change something inside it if we have to do that. And our repeater that, uh, that was installed over at the animal shelter is actually a Motorola repeater that was originally used for public service use. And it has been modified to operate on the amateur radio band. So that's a modification by an amateur of commercial equipment for use on our band. Uh, we can modify existing equipment. We can build our own equipment, either from kits or parts. We can even design our own gear and even sell it to other hams. If we do, they take personal responsibility for using it in accordance with the rules. Okay, so why does it need FCC certification? Why does that Yesu radio even need an FCC certification if the rules specifically don't say anything about it? Well, those radios are certified under part 15, not part 97 or part 90 or part 95. Um, of course, that Eddie Tone radio is certified under 95 for the land mobile service because it's a commercial radio. But what about part 15? What the heck's part 15? Well, if we look it up, part 15 is radio frequency devices. That's the generic section or the generic part of the rules for any electronic devices that may emit or be affected by radio frequency radiation. So pretty much anything you find that's electronic that has an FCC sticker on it is certified under this part 15. So this is the rule that says that the device will not give off excessive radio frequency interference and will accept any radio frequency interference that it might be exposed to. So if you've ever looked through the manual for your brand new LCD TV, there's a section in there where it says, this device is certified under part 15 of the FCC rules and must accept any inter interference that it may be exposed to and may not give off any excessive radio frequency interference. You'll see it on everything. You'll see it on monitors, TVs, clock radios, computers, microwave ovens. I mean, anything with any electronics in it pretty much is going to have this because electronics uses electricity. Electricity makes RF. So any of those devices are potentially able to give off RF radiation or be affected by receiving RF radiation. And what the Part 15 certification says is, hey, this device is going to be able to do this thing and it's going to do it in the manner that is specified in the, in the rules. It's gonna accept any interference that's given to it without breaking or catching fire or anything like that. It's not going to cause interference or hopefully not. Um, sometimes those devices will be broken or uh, damaged in some way that they do give off interference and we have encountered that. Um, you know, that's something that you may run into, but if it's part 15 certified and it's not damaged, then it shouldn't be doing that. So what about gear that hasn't been certified yet? So we talked briefly about that when we were looking at those labels. Typically this gear is waiting for part 15 certification. Again, as an amateur radio operator, we can use the equipment even if it's not certified by the FCC but we do take responsibility for that. Uh, commercial gear certified under part 90 or 95 can generally be used by amateurs under the same part 97 rules that let us use other equipment. Uh, gear that's intended for amateur use is generally okay, but some of the gear you'll find out there is not great. It's really bad. It might produce harmonics well outside the amateur bands. It might not stay on frequency very well. It might not be very well built or very well tested. That's something that you as the amateur radio operator are responsible for. You're responsible for the legality of the equipment you are using. So when you take that test and get that license, you're not only saying, hey, I'm smart enough to know what I'm doing here, I'm also smart enough to know not to do things that I shouldn't be doing. So what should I do? Buy and use quality equipment. You can buy cheap equipment and test it yourself. 
You can buy and use cheap equipment, but read the reviews first and make sure other people have tested it, people hopefully that you trust, or you could build your own gear and test it yourself. So do I say not to use those Chinese radios? No, I don't say that because a lot of them are just fine, but some of them are not. So where do I find these reviews? There's several good places to find reviews. Uh, eham.net has a whole review section. Uh, there's a site called the Radio Judge that has uh, several radios that they have examined and, and they talk about how good they are, how not good they are. Ham Universe has equipment reviews. The QRZ forums have equipment reviews. There's also some information on the ARRL website if you're an ARRL member uh, that you can access where they have done actual uh, electronic analysis of several devices and they will actually show you those test results. So that's a, that's a good resource to use if you're a member of the RRL. You can also go to YouTube. There are several dozen YouTube channels that have good hands-on reviews and analysis. I've seen uh, reviews where they actually hook the radio up to an oscilloscope and watch when they transmit, watch to see where the emissions are coming out at and if they're out of band or not, uh, if there are any spurious harmonics or anything like that and how bad they are. Um, you know, the people will actually test the stuff and they'll post videos of themselves testing it. You can find those online. Uh, some of the sites that I look at for these types of things are Ham Radio 2.0, uh, the Ham Radio Crash Course, Ham Radio Concepts, and K6UDA's channel uh, for those kinds of reviews. But all you have to do is go into YouTube and search for the particular radio you're interested in and the keyword review, and you will probably find half a dozen different people who have reviewed it. Some of those reviews are better than others. Some of them are more technical than others. So your mileage may vary as far as what those reviews look like. But if you're looking to spend you know, some money on a good radio, you probably want to do some research before you actually buy it. All right, so that was really fast. How much time did we take here? Barely half an hour. Um, that's really all I have to talk about. We can actually go on to the FCC site and look at some of these, uh, talk about what is actually in there. Um, but first, does anybody have any questions or comments or things of that sort? Yeah, I was noticing, uh, uh, and I think I got this from a YouTube video review, the Baofeng UV5, which is a pretty popular radio, they realized it had a lot of spurious emissions. It was not very, very good. And Baofeng actually redesigned it or, or modified it, and now they have a, a GT UV5 model. That is amazing, that, yes. That is um, compliant with the FCC's guidelines for spurious emissions. Yeah, that's, so uh, that's if you, actually. If you have to choose, you can you can choose one that is going to comply with with the FCC rules, at least in that model. Yeah, that that and actually some of the UV five Rs were were okay, and some of them were not. So that uh, originally that was kind of a crapshoot. You know, you might if you bought a UV five R, you had no guarantee if it was going to be good or bad. So you needed to actually test it yourself. Yeah. Um, but that, that new GT one, I, I saw a review on that where they did an analysis of it. And yeah, that, that one is like a very decent radio and it's still cheap, it's still relatively cheap. So, you know, definitely something that you can look at. Other comments? I have one comment. Yeah, go ahead, Sherwood. Mobile GRMS radio. So, so it's supposed to be a 40 watt radio. You indicated that you're not supposed to do more than 15 watts? Well, so that depends on some things, right? So GMRS actually allows you to go up to 50 watts when you're using a repeater system. And GMRS actually supports repeaters and, and several things that uh, most people don't bother to use. But, uh, but yeah, you can actually use up to, I think, 50 watts on GMRS. You can actually have an antenna that's up to... Uh, 60 feet tall for GMRS, you know, there, there are several different requirements. And, and if you look at those FCC rules, you can see you know, what some of those requirements are. So I definitely recommend taking a read through those. 
Uh, I know that Dan actually ordered some GMRS radios that were definitely not compliant uh, because they could be tuned outside of GMRS band for starters. And that's a, that's a no-no for GMRS. So, you know, that was uh, something you need to be aware of when you're, when you're looking at that sort of equipment. Uh, generally, if you're using a GMRS radio from a, a known manufacturer like Midland or somebody like that, uh, you're probably gonna be fine. But if you're using one from one of the Chinese manufacturers, you might want to check and make sure that it's actually compliant. Um, it doesn't hurt to go look at the certification and see what it actually says. And if you're going to be using it on GMRS, it needs to be certified under the specific part that we're talking about. Do you happen to have that, uh, that radio where you can get the FCC ID off of it, Sherwood? I can get it real quick, just a minute. Gonna stop sharing here, and I'm gonna bring up a browser with some with the FCC site in it. Okay, where is it gonna be on here? So there should be a label on it somewhere um, that has an FCC ID on it. it so is this a, a handheld radio or a mobile type radio? I found it, it's underneath the clip on these Midland. It's, uh, did you want the code? Yeah, if you can give it to me, we'll switch it for you. Yeah, of course, if I can read it. <laughs> MX6, no, MMA GXT 105. Zero G. Okay. That's a handheld. All right. Let me uh, let me share this window so you guys can see. This uh, FCC ID code is M M A M X T four hundred. Okay. We'll look at yours in a second, Sherwood. But let's look at the one that uh, that Roger gave us here. So this is the information that I have on it. It says. Um, this is a licensed non-broadcast transmitter held to base. So it says it's a GMRS radio and it should definitely be certified under um, part 95. And you can see here, it shows that these are the frequencies that it operates on. And these are the rule parts that that corresponds to. Um, and these, this is the emission designator that it's supposed to be using on that. So uh, it's saying that it's going to be using uh, F3E, which is uh, FM voice. So that radio should be certified under part 95. It should be legal for GMRS. Uh, and then again, here it has links to all of the information. For example, the test report, the uh, uh, applicant letter for modification, any information that went back and forth between the FCC and the manufacturer when it was being tested. There's gonna be a photo of the test setup, internal photos of the device, uh, indicator of where the label is, external photos of those, all this kind of information is on here on the FCC site. So Sherwood, go ahead and give me that, uh, that one that you have again. Okay, it is M, M. A M X T four hundred. Let's see what that one says. Okay, so again, that says mobile GMRS transceiver, uh, licensed non-broadcast station transmitter, and it says that it is certified under Part ninety five A for all four frequency ranges that it operates under. And it does say that it will do up to 40 watts on 462.55 through 462.725 and 40 watts on 467.55 through 467.725. So that one is definitely certified 
under part 95, which is the part for GMRS. We could actually go and look at that rule part. Here's part 95, subsection A. And you can see here where it shows all the different rules that, uh, that are involved here. So it talks about the emission types, it talks about uh, FRS, it talks about GMRS, uh, CB radio service. Here's the GMRS section. And you'll notice that's an interesting factor. The one that Roger gave us did say part 95E and this one does not say anything about part 95E, it only says part 95A. So it's only using the general um, requirements of part 95. It's not using the specific GMRS requirements. So that's an interesting factor. Um, so again, let's look at, here's, here's the rules. This is the FCC rules. And if you go, um, let's see, I'll show you how I got here. So the first thing I did was I went to FCC.gov. And then I went to, I remember how I got here, um, proceedings and actions. And then I went to commission documents. And then from here, there is, uh, where is it? To find it again. Well, I wonder where I found that now. Who was that? Let's see here. Check the history here. So it was under FCC rules and regulations for 2047. So maybe I didn't go directly from here. Maybe I just searched for it, FCC rules. Rules and regulations for Title 97, Title 47, sorry. Uh, and then the various parts, and it's broken down 0 through 19, 20 through 39. Uh, the parts we're interested in are in this category. And again, we're interested mainly in uh, Part 97, which is the amateur radio service. In the case of what we were just talking about there with the GMRS radios, we're interested in Part 95, which is personal radio services. And again, you can see all the requirements here. So if we look at that GMRS section, it actually says, let's see, transmitter certification. Let's see what it says about that. It says each GMRS transmitter uh, operates or is intended to operate a GMRS must be certified in accordance with subpart, this subpart and part two of this chapter. Uh, grant will not be issued for any GMRS transmitter type that fails to comply with the rules in this section. So here's one of the key factors for GMRS is if it's designed to operate outside of the GMRS bands, it's not going to get certified. Um, here's an interesting thing. After January, after December 27, 2017, uh, you can't have a radio that is certified for both GMRS and FRS. Um, the FCC will no longer grant equipment authorization for handheld portable units if the units meet the requirements to be certified under the FRS part. So that's interesting. Used to be if you bought an FRS GMRS radio, it can work on both GMRS and FRS. So you had to know the difference. But since December 27th, 2017, that's not allowed. 
Well, let's see. Here's the power. You know, that costs the uh, a lot of the manufacturers a lot of money. I mean, we're talking a lot of money because um, they were advertising all these units that would transmit for 23 miles and all this kind of stuff. And Right. And uh, they had to take a lot of that back and change a lot of the advertising. Yeah. It really cost them a lot. Yeah. So, okay. So here's, here's the interesting section about the transmitting power requirements right here. It says the transmitter output power of mobile repeater and base stations must not exceed 50 Watts. The transmitter output power of fixed stations must not exceed 15 Watts. And the effective radiated power of mobile handheld portable and base stations transmitting on the 462 megahertz interstitial channels must not exceed five watts. And here, the effective radiated power of handheld portable units transmitting on 467 megahertz must not exceed 0.5 watts. So there are quite a few different power requirements that are associated with GMRS. So I think Sherwood, your radio with 40 watts is probably fine under this part here, as long as it's not considered a fixed station. So there's probably a definition somewhere of what a fixed station is, and I'm not sure exactly where we would find that. But um, so one those. other question I have on this, then I've been hooking it up to my uh, MFJ 1868 antenna. It's 45 feet in the air. Uh huh. So that should be legal too, right? Well, let's take a look and see what it says about antennas here. Let's see. So we care about this in accordance with this particular part. Let's make sure we're in the right part here. Let's go back in the GRS. Let's see what we can find about antennas in regards to GMRS. So GMRS was that subpart. Okay, here's the GMRS section. There, GMRS antenna height limits. GMRS station antennas must meet the requirements in section 95317 regarding menaces to air navigation and consult part 17 of the FCC rules for more information. So let's look at 95317 and see what that says. So it says here, each antenna structure used for personal radio services subject to the antenna structure rules set forth in part 17. Uh, power of an antenna structure more than 60.96 meters in height may be required to notify the FAA and register the antenna structure. Let's see. Stations on or near military or public use airport. I don't think that applies to you. Um, so it looks like there are no special GMRS antenna requirements other than that it not be over 200 feet tall. So that's different from what I said originally. Um, so the rules are correct. How about effective radiated power, though? Because uh, if you're using 40 watts and you lose like what? 4 dB on connections and such, and you've got a 10 dB gain antenna, you're putting out a lot of wattage. Again, the, the maximum wattage was 50 watts. So I think, I think he's probably OK there. So it sounds like you're safe, Sherwin. 
You're not breaking. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) I use this every Sunday at four o'clock on the the ward net. Oh, the ward, your ward's doing it on GMRS now. Well, I've been using this one because we've been able to do, you know, some have FRS, some has GRMS. I have the license for the GRMS. You do have a license for GMRS? Yes. Okay. Um, so one of the things about GMRS, you know how on, uh, on the amateur bands, we have to ID every uh, 10 minutes? Uh, GMRS actually requires you to ID every 15 minutes. I actually found that the other day when I was looking through Every here. 15 minutes? Every 15 minutes, yeah. I just figured I would do that uh, every 10, just like we do on the amateur radio. Then, then you're probably fine as long as you do that because 10 is less than 15, so you should be good. But uh, the requirement for GMRS, I remember seeing it, was uh, was um, every 15 minutes. Let me see if I can find that in here. GMRS station identification. Uh, let's see. The GMRS station call sign must be transmitted following a single transmission or series of transmissions after 15 minutes and at least once every 15 minutes thereafter during a series of transmissions lasting more than 15 minutes. It must be transmitted using voice in English language or international Morse code using an audible tone. And there's an interesting fact. I do need to use my uh, GRMS uh, call sign. Yes. So during the war, we have a number of people that have GRMS radios and have a license, but they haven't really used their call sign. Well, the regulations require you to say it, so you should probably start saying it and maybe suggest that people do that. Uh, one if- other question, then, uh, from what I understand, one license in a house is fine. So yes. everybody uses the same call sign. That is correct. Yeah. In fact, it's not just a household. It can be used by a group. So for example, your ward could register a GMRS call sign for the ward's use, and it could be used by anybody in the ward for communications related to the ward. Oh, I didn't realize that. So yeah, for example, the ward went out and bought 14 GRMS radio in the bishop's office. They just sit there. (laughs) <laughs> well, perhaps they should uh, invest in a license. Uh, I think the GMRS license is good for five years or something like that. So oh, it's 10 years. Is it 10 now? Yeah, it's $70 for 10 years. Yeah, so that's, that's not unreasonable. Wait a few months, they'll be ha- less than that. That's right, because they were recently changing the license fees, and we as amateurs are going to have to start paying uh, I think it's 35, but other services are going to be paying less, right? So that's correct. So GRMS may go down to 35? Yeah. 70? Yeah, it's supposed to be enough to cover their costs in managing it. Uh, apparently, the Congress passed a law that said that the FCC had to charge license fees in conjunction with what their cost is. So I will mention that to him about uh, getting an award license so that we can do it legally and use those radios that we have. Yeah. Now, the people who are using FRS radios to talk to you guys on GMRS, um, there are some restrictions on that back in this FRS section. Let's see. Where was that? go back to the top so this part b is the frs section um i know they use okay so here it is frs units normally communicate with other frs units but may also be used to communicate with gmrs stations so they are okay on an frs radio to not id with that gmrs id gmrs id 
So if their radio is an FRS radio and not a GMRS radio, they don't have to have the license. They don't have to use the license. Well, I would say that uh, 90 percent of us that are reporting, checking in on Sunday have GRMS radios and the license. They, they've all obtained licenses. They have obtained licenses, then they, you should they should be fine. Yeah. But if anyone is checking in with an FRS radio, they would not need a license to do that. Well, I'm going to have to let them know that they will have to start reporting their uh, call sign that they they've got on those licenses. Yeah. Uh, so there's another interesting thing here. Originally, FRS was not allowed to use uh, any kind of digital emissions, and that was changed. Uh, I can't remember when exactly it was changed, but they did make it so there. If you guys have seen those, uh, uh, I think the company is called Rhino. They make a, a GMRS radio and an FRS radio that has uh, GPS built into it. Kind of works like APRS. It can send its position data out over the radio. That they actually had a special um, exception to the rules when they first came out. And now it's actually part of the rules that they are allowed to do that. So your FRS radios that include that functionality are legal. And Garmin makes those. Does Garmin make those now? Yeah, well, Garmin made the- The rhinos. Had, yeah, yeah. Cause I had a couple of guys that used them for hunting. Yeah. Yeah, so originally that was not legal except that the the rhinos were specifically, they had an exception, a specific exception to allow them to do it. So, but they, at some point they changed the rule to make it legal for everybody. All right, other questions, comments, and things? If you want, we can go look at part 97, which is part we care about right um, let's see um jan i do have a question yeah um i this isn't with the fcc but the the LDS church um i know that they uh it seems like um they don't like the ham radio um, antennas on um the the church buildings um i don't know if that goes with gmrs or not um, back over, um, back over to you, Jen. Yeah, I don't know. That would be their own particular regulations, because as far as I'm aware, there's no restrictions on putting antennas on uh, on structures that are privately owned. So, you know, as far as the FCC is concerned, I don't think there would be any restrictions on that. If the if the church decides in their wisdom that. They don't like the way those antennas look, and so they don't want them on their buildings. That's their choice to make that decision. So, you know, that's, and I think it would apply if it applies to amateur radios. I suspect it would apply to GMRS antennas as well. I don't see any why there would be a, a difference between the two. So if we jump back into section 97, this is the part that is relevant to amateur radio operators. And you can see there's a lot of information in here. You probably want to get yourself familiarized with at least the kinds of information that's in here so that you know where to go if you need to know something. Uh, one of the most interesting sections is this uh, section on providing emergency communications. So if we go and look at that, uh, basically, um, it basically says that you can pretty much do whatever you need to do if there's an emergency. If safety of life or protection of property are involved, uh, if you're in distress or anything like that, you can basically use whatever you need to use to communicate with anybody you need to communicate with. So that's, uh, you know, just because you're a licensed amateur doesn't mean you're not allowed buy your license to pick up and use that uh, police radio that happens to be sitting there when the officer is down for whatever reason, grab that radio and start talking to the dispatcher because, you know, they, 
it's quite likely that other people will be afraid to pick up the microphone. But as amateur radio operators, we do it all the time. So, you know, we should be perfectly willing to step in and help out with a situation like that. Um, there's a there's a ton of information in these rules. It's very very good to read through this section and see, you know, exactly what you're uh, committing to and what you're agreeing to when you get that amateur radio license. Any other questions, comments, things of that sort? Okay, if not, I'm going to stop sharing and stop the recording.